Thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me in the back? Okay, good, good. I want to recognize and thank the Organization of American Historians and the Distinguished uh, Lecture Program uh, tonight. I want to thank Dr. Curtis Ellison for that generous introduction and for his invitation to come speak here. And I'd like to thank LaDonna Hoskins for all of her uh, work in helping me get here uh, today. That was, uh, that was terrific. Um, I am uh, so impressed with the Michael J. Colligan uh, program and what is happening here to keep history in front of the public. And uh, so I, it's a great honor to be here and, and to be part of it. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I think it's fair to say, and I want to just start with the, the bold statement, that I think that railroads in the 1850s and 1860s were like the internet today. They shaped society for Americans in the 19th century in ways that weren't fully apparent to the participants themselves. Just like the internet today, we, we can't fully understand all that it's doing to us uh, and our culture and our politics and our society. And so as a beginning point, that's where I was coming from in thinking about the 19th century. How can we go back and look at the railroads and understand them uh, in ways that weren't apparent to the participants themselves at the time? Now, I'm going to start this evening with two stories. And I'm going to try to interweave them one after, uh, after the other. One about an enslaved man named Samuel Balton and one about an Ohioan named Ephraim Cutler Dawes. Now, out of curiosity, how many of you have heard of Ephraim Cutler Dawes? I'm just curious. Here in Ohio. OK. All right. Well, this is Samuel Balton. And uh, we're going to take up Ephraim Cutler Dawes in just a second. For me, their stories tell us how we might think about the coming of the Civil War, what was at stake, the way it unfolded, and its modern qualities. Their stories take place in different theaters of the war, Ohio and Virginia, but they are related in striking ways. And as we will see, they come together. Samuel Balton. Samuel Balton was born into slavery on New Year's Day in 1838 on Vincent Marmaduke's plantation in Westmoreland County, Virginia. It's about 80 miles south of Washington, D.C. The county was home to the Washington families and the Lee families. It was part of a rich district in Tidewater, Virginia, growing wheat and livestock, raising livestock and growing tobacco. But when the Civil War broke out in April of 1861, everything changed for Samuel Balton. He later recalled that Marmaduke immediately sent all of the, quote, able-bodied slaves, including Balton to work as section hands on the Virginia Central Railroad in the Blue Ridge Mountains, about 150 miles west of his home county of, of Westmoreland. Now, slaves had worked for years on the Virginia Central Railroad in the early 1850s. They blasted and built the Blue Ridge Tunnel. At the time of its completion, the Blue Ridge Tunnel was the longest in the United States and one of the longest in the world. Uh, what you're looking at here are the ruins of the Blue Ridge Tunnel today. Uh, it was built entirely with slave and Irish labor. Irish on one side of the mountain, slave labor on the other side of the mountain. Eventually, it was an entirely uh, enslaved work crew uh, blasting out the tunnel, laying the tracks, and grading the lines. To me, this, this was a very important sort of part of my study uh, the, the, the Blue Ridge Tunnel because uh, it, br it brought together the way slavery was being transformed in the 1850s, applied to new industrial settings, particularly the railroads. And I hadn't really realized how common this was, this experience that Samuel Balton had in being sent out hundreds of miles away from uh, his family. He was married uh, even as a slave. He considered himself to have a family, and he was sent off to work on the Virginia Central Railroad. In fact, thousands of slaves, I discovered, worked on the railroads, right up to and during the Civil War. All over the South, they graded the lines, built the bridges, blasted the tunnels, they hauled timber, they cut wood, they shoveled dirt and stone. 
skilled slaves, especially blacksmiths and stone masons and carpenters, worked on the railroads too. And railroad companies and contractors hired slaves by the hundreds. And they also purchased slaves directly. I had not realized this, but, but railroad companies in the South, all over the South in the 1850s, were buying slaves. The company was buying slaves, not just hiring them. And so by the 1850s, the South railroad companies could be counted among the largest slaveholders in their respective regions. The railroads, in fact, developed special accounting procedures to handle slave property. They created on their balance sheet uh, often a Negro fund, and it just had the amount held as, as uh, an asset. In fact, in South Carolina, the South Carolina Railroad's 1856 report, annual report to its stockholders, just as an example, the company claimed $71,727.89 in slave property. A year later, in 1857, the South Carolina Railroad's annual report didn't list an amount, it just listed the number of slaves, 57, owned by the company. Two years later, in 1859, that same railroad, in its annual report, held even more in bondage, 90 slaves. So the South Carolina Railroad had gone from, uh, in a very short period of time, from 57 slaves to 90 slaves in company ownership. That makes it one of the largest plantation uh, or companies, entities in slaveholding in the region. So the point here is that slavery was advancing with the railroads in lockstep in the South. The huge expansion of railroads in the South opened new cotton lands all over the interior. No longer dependent on river traffic, cotton could be brought to market in places it never could have uh, been, it, it wasn't feasible before to plant. And slaves were being employed in these new industrial settings, like blasting the Blue Ridge Tunnel. And so slavery appeared to be marking a new direction in the South in the late 1850s. Ephraim C. Dawes. In April 1861, while Samuel Bolton was sent as a slave to work on the Virginia Central Railroad, Ephraim C. Dawes volunteered for service in an Ohio regiment. And in September, he was among the first recruits for the 53rd Ohio to arrive at Camp Jackson, Camp Jackson, Ohio. In October, of 1861, Dawes, by then a first lieutenant, asked his college friend William Stevenson to take the next train, visit his camp, and bring him all the newspapers he could buy. Quote, we are fixed up so we can accommodate you first rate, Dawes wrote his friend. Dawes greeted the war with this kind of exuberance, this kind of enthusiasm, like it was an adventure. This was an opportunity to put his Republican Party loyalties to the test, to put his union convictions to the test. Now, a few years earlier, Ephraim Dawes was in college, a student studying at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And he spent some time at a, at a little place called Marietta College at that point as well, uh, a couple of years there. But in 1856, when bloody Kansas erupted on the national scene, Dawes was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Young Dawes followed the congressional campaign of his uncle, William P. Cutler, who had served as president of the Marietta and Cincinnati Railroad. And nearly every letter he wrote, and he wrote numerous letters, they're all at the Newberry Library in Chicago, but nearly every letter he wrote between 1855 and 1860 mentioned the railroad. What was it doing? Where is it now? What's happening on the railroad? The fortunes of the free soil and the Republican parties were also top on his list. I consider Dawes part of a new young Republican party movement, much of it based in the, in the Midwest, in Illinois, in Iowa, in Ohio, and I call these young men railroad Republicans. They invested their energies in this new technology. They saw it transforming their society around free labor, and they were convinced that their society, their civilization, was advanced and modern 
and extending into the new west. Dawes's heroes were John C. Fremont, the Republican candidate for president, Salmon P. Chase, the abolitionist governor of Ohio, Cassius Clay, one of the founders of the Republican Party. Now these men appeared to young Ephraim Dawes to be willing to stand up to the South, and no issue was more important to Dawes at that time than the Wilmot Proviso. That's the amendment that would bar, propose to bar slavery from the territories acquired in the Mexican War. Indeed, it was their stand on the proviso that would inspire all of these other Republican candidates, Dawes thought, who, as he wrote, quote, will neither give nor take an insult. So Dawes was looking at the South and its aggressive expansion into the West, and he wanted men in the Republican Party who would neither give, they would be gentlemanly but firm, <laughs> or take an insult from, as they called it of the day, the slave power. A few months later in 1856, when Ephraim's brother, Henry, decided to go to Kansas as a free soil settler, young Ephraim Dawes wrote in a letter, he could, he could hardly contain his excitement. I am going to, he wrote. I've always wanted to go. He was practically bursting at the seams to, uh, to, to be a free soil settler to defend this vision of Republican liberty and of Republicanism. In 1861, their older brother, Ephraim Dawes's and Henry Dawes's older brother, Rufus Robinson Dawes, joined the Union cause as well. And some of you Civil War historians probably know Rufus R. Dawes. He would become Lieutenant Colonel commanding the 6th Wisconsin, one of the most famous units in the Iron Brigade, the Black Hats, uh, the tough Northwestern boys who fought uh, so hard at Gettysburg. But in February 1862, Ephraim Dawes' uh, 53rd Ohio Regiment had orders to move out of Camp Jackson and they rode the trains to Portsmouth, Ohio, and then they took the steamboat south to Paducah, Kentucky, and there on February 23rd, they were issued Austrian-made rifles, drilled in their use, issued and outfitted for battle. After a long steamboat journey, on March 19th, they disembarked at a place called Pittsburgh Landing, and on April 6th, 1862, they fought in the Battle of Shiloh. Now, after the Battle of Shiloh, Dawes spent much of 1862 and 1863 with his Ohio regiment, stationed throughout sort of northern Alabama and Tennessee. He saw a few large battles, but he was up there guarding railroads and fighting Confederate guerrillas along the Alabama and Tennessee state line. This is a map that he drew in one of his many, many letters. And I think it gives us a different vision of the war. We're so used to, in the Civil War, seeing maps, bird's eye view maps, aren't we, of, of, of the battles or of, of uh, the region, um, of the theater. But soldiers drew maps too, um, compressed maps, sorry, compressed, the compressed geography of their war, of where they went. And there was often in these letters back and forth from home to the soldiers in the field, Often soldiers asked for maps from their relatives. Send me a map of Kentucky. I have no idea where I am, they would write. <laughs> and uh, George Cram wrote a letter like that to his mother and, and his mother sent him a map and then he writes the next letter, he writes back, uh, thank you, I know exactly where I am now. <laughs> so this gives us a different picture of, um, of the Civil War, however. I think this, uh, first of all, for Dawes, the war was, was far removed, other than the Battle of Shiloh, the war was far removed from, uh, um, from the major battles. Instead, through two long years, he was largely in this tromping back and forth in this area of, uh, of Tennessee and Alabama all along the, the, the railroad line. It was all about the railroads for Dawes and his unit, guarding it, protecting it, tearing it up if the Confederates advanced, rebuilding it, keeping the guerrillas away from it. We're going to come back to Dawes in just a second. Samuel Balton. While Ephraim Dawes was making his way down by steamboat to Pittsburgh Landing, 
in 1862. At some point in early 1862, Samuel Balton was transferred from the mountains of Western Virginia, 150 miles from home, as I said, to a place called Fredericks Hall Station, only 45 miles northwest of Richmond, and not very far from his home county and his wife. And there, he began to plan his escape from slavery. He and a small group of men struck out for the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad. And they followed the railroad north to Fredericksburg. And at one point, they met up with the roadmaster who had hired them. And this is, this is also very uh, uh, typical. I've, I've seen, uh, Frederick Douglass, who escapes slavery on the railroad, uh, has three encounters on his way north. While he's in disguise as a, as a free sailor, he's trying to keep to himself, and he's, he's being very careful on that ride from Baltimore to Wilmington to Philadelphia. And three times he runs into, or he goes past people that he knows, he sees, he encounters. And uh, several times when the trains pass and they stop and Douglas looks out the window and one of his former masters is in the car looking in the window glances his way um, similarly Balton and his friends making their escape run into the very man who had employed them and they tell him oh yes uh, we're on the job and, <laughs> and they keep going <laughs> Somehow they get past this guy. They make their way into Union lines outside of Fredericksburg. The first unit they encountered was the 6th Wisconsin Regiment, Rufus R. Dawes unit. The 6th Wisconsin, in fact, had only arrived in Fredericksburg on April 22nd, 1862. So if we try to piece this together and understand when Balton actually made his break, if you look in the official records of the War of Rebellion and track the 6th Wisconsin, you'll find that they spent all of May and June up in the northern part of Virginia, marching from one place to another. They weren't in Falmouth. They weren't in Fredericksburg. They were only there for a very short window at that, point, at that moment. And so it seems likely that Balton made his escape at the very first possible moment. The only window he had when Union troops were close enough that he could get to them. It's late April. That's when he makes his escape. He becomes a cook for the 6th Wisconsin. Now, these men are in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, and uh, like many African Americans in 18, late 1861 and 1862, uh, when they had the first opportunity, as did Samuel Balton, and they were working on the railroad, they left and went to Union lines as, and then began working for the Union Army on its railroads, later what would be called the United States Military Railroad. Um, by the end of the war, as we'll see, the United States Military Railroad, largely because of General Sherman, as we heard about, uh, is running one of the largest railroad networks in the world at the end of the Civil War. But Balton, I think, does something else. In the records of the War of Rebellion, on August 6th, 1862, the 6th Wisconsin conducted a raid. Where? Fredericks Hall Station, where Balton had been only months before. They, quote, destroyed bridges and railroad track and burned a large amount of Confederate supplies. In fact, Rufus Dawes wrote a memoir of the war, uh, Service with the 6th Wisconsin, and he describes the Frederick, Fredericks Hall raid in great detail. But he doesn't mention Samuel Balton by name, and he doesn't mention uh, whether a slave directed them to Fredericks Hall Station on the Virginia Central. But, but I think it's likely. We don't know whether Balton guided him. We don't know whether he provided key intelligence about the location of Confederate material there. But evidence suggests from all over the official records that the black railroad workers across the South had valuable information about the, the system, 
about the supplies, about the movement of forces, and they gave it to the Union uh, Army at the first opportunity. They served as guides on raid after raid from Florida to South Carolina to Virginia. So I, I think Balton was involved in this, or his group of men were. And actually, there's no other raid that the 6th Wisconsin conducts that summer uh, that explicitly targets a railroad station. Well, two years later, in 1864, Samuel Balton traveled to Boston, Massachusetts to enlist in the 5th Massachusetts Cavalry. That's a regiment of the United States Colored Troops. And after the war, Balton moved north to Long Island to become a prosperous farmer. He ended up with $5,000 in real estate and a thriving business, and he earned a reputation as, you saw it earlier, the Pickle King for growing 1.5 million cukes in, uh, one year. And so he got this reputation. He became a local hero up in gr uh, Greenlawn, uh, New York. But he also joined Brooklyn's William Lloyd Garrison GAR post. And in fact, that, that, uh, fo that grainy photograph from the newspaper that I showed uh, uh, a few minutes ago, uh, I'm trying to find a better, the, the original. <laughs> uh, but his, um, below the fold there, he had his GAR post medal on in 1914, proudly wearing his, uh, his uh, Grand Army of the Republic medallion. Last sequence, Ephraim C. Dawes. Now this, this story affected me greatly, uh, and it's why I wrote about it in the book, and why Dawes is something of a hero for me. But some of this is difficult to take, so brace yourself, okay? While Balton was joining the USCT in Boston, enlisting in the 5th Massachusetts United States Colored Troops, in May and June of 1864, the young major, Ephraim Dawes, found himself with Sherman's huge army in the 15th Corps in the Army of the Tennessee. He was marching dozens of miles a day, skirmishing and fighting his way down with his unit through Snake Creek Gap on the Atlanta campaign, down the Western and Atlantic Railroad, that vital link, down through Resaca, through Kingston, he fought at all the battles. He had even taken his wounded friend, William Stevenson, the man who wrote him, who he wrote at the beginning of the war, his old pal from college. He'd taken William Stevenson, who by then was uh, a broken man in a way, uh, broken down from the war. He took Stevenson to the depot at Kingston and sent him home an event that, according to Ephraim Dawes's diary, quote, left him feeling blue. And on May 27th, at a little crossroads near Dallas, Georgia, he had privately celebrated his 24th birthday. The next day, Dawes was horribly wounded. He wrote in his diary on May 28th, quote, had my lower jaw shot off. The mini ball took out all of his lower teeth, his lip, tongue, and chin, leaving a bloody mass hanging in his throat open and bleeding profusely. The sensation Dawes wrote a few weeks later, and this is remarkable that, uh, that he, he's writing about this afterwards. Um, of course, so many men died uh, from wounds that uh, they never wrote letters about what happened to them. but. Uh, with Dawes, we have a different story. You can tell that he uh, lives. He wrote, the sensation was as if a hot, a red hot iron had been thrust through my face with the speed of lightning. He went down immediately from the impact, and after a few moments of stunned incomprehension, he crawled on his hands and knees toward the rear of the battle lines. The litter ambulance took him further to the rear near the field hospital. And when he saw a surgeon, Dawes sarcastically wrote in the dust with his finger, good for 30 days leave. <laughs> he felt, by his own account, pretty good. That's in quotes. 
but he had to sit up in order to keep breathing. And when the doctors held up a mirror to show him the wound, Dawes explained to his family that he wanted to cry, but instead tried, quote, to smile with my eyes. A few days later, Dawes took one of the most difficult railroad trips of his life, from Chattanooga to Nashville. Clogged with war supplies and traffic, the train slowed to a crawl, and the journey stretched to 26 hours. In his diary, he managed to scribble, quote, a trip that I shall always look on with horror. Dawes sat in the back seat of the passenger car, partly, he said, to keep from being looked at and partly, he said, to get a sight of the country. But he couldn't avoid the attention, and hence the horror. Quote, people looking at me annoyed me almost beyond explanation, he later fumed. Dawes had to enlist his traveling companion, a, a fellow wounded soldier, to shoo away all those who were gawking at him. And when his old pal, William Stevenson, met him at the depot in Louisville, Kentucky, Dawes confessed, Perhaps I wasn't glad to see him. Now, on the railroad trip home, Dawes wrote to his parents and his siblings and tried to explain that what he had experienced and wa was something that he could, he could get through and to try to assure them that he was still the same man if grossly disfigured. His determination and his stoicism could have been nothing other than astonishing to his family. Dawes wrote from the train that his wound was, quote, sloughing freely, very painful and offensive, and that he was nervous and weak, but it was the staring of the other passengers that bothered him more than the pain. This is the return trip of a veteran we don't, often don't hear about in the Civil War and why I think it's important to, uh, to talk about it. Now, after a few months recuperating at a soldier's hospital, Dawes went to live with his uncle and his aunt, William P. and Julia Cutler, uh, the former congressman, in Marietta, Ohio. And uh, Congressman Cutler helped uh, Ephraim Dawes get a job with the Marietta Railroad as a clerk. He was, after all, president of the railroad, so. <laughs> but once back in Ohio in 1864, the Civil War was, of course, not over. Dawes was at home and he underwent an innovative medical procedure. And his case was studied for years afterwards in the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion. It's a four volume set of medical history facts about the Civil War. In September of that year, Professor George C. Blackman performed an operation designed to restore Dawes's lower lip using, quote, hair, lip, and interrupted sutures with transverse adhesive straps and water dressings. A renowned surgeon, Blackman was also a moody and despairing uh, genius. Addicted to opium and reckless with his personal finances, the doctor was bold and dashing with the scalpel. He cut Dawes's cheeks open and stretched the skin to hold an artificial under jaw and teeth, a prosthetic, and to form an under lip. Now Dawes took this treatment without chloroform. <laughs> Flat on his back with Rufus R. Dawes, Lieutenant Colonel of the 6th Wisconsin, the Iron Brigade group, uh, holding his hands and holding him down. But the operation was too much, and Dawes nearly choked to death in his own blood, or at least he thought he was. And unable to breathe, at one point, he ripped the prosthetic jaw and teeth out and threw them aside in a panic in the middle of the operation. A few months later, Dawes underwent a second operation with Blackman, and the jaw was fitted properly. And in the following months, he grew a full beard to cover what he called the shocking deformity. He married his uh, sweetheart, Francis, here they are in 1883. Equipped with this prosthetic jaw, Dawes, I, I, can't, I don't think he can speak. I, I have not been able to <laughs> find the evidence one way or another whether he had any capacity to speak uh, after the war, but I think not. Um, but he wrote histories 
after the war, keeping the heroism of his regiment alive and the stakes of the war for the next generation. In fact, his post-war account of his uncle, William P. Cutler, was very important to me because it's this account, he writes this history of William P. Cutler, uh, who was congressman in the run-up to the, to the secession crisis and during the early part of the Civil War. And for Ephraim Dawes, it was slavery and railroads together that made the South so dangerous, so potentially expansionist in a way that had to be met in the territories. Slavery and railroads, they were at the heart of the Civil War, the cause of the Civil War. If they didn't cause it, there's a correlation. Let's just say that. The South, Dawes wrote, had long been preparing for the conflict by building railroads, and the people of the North could not be made to believe it was impending. So this, this important observation about this correlation between the growth of slavery, the pace of the growth of, sl growth of slavery in the 1850s, and the pace of the growth of railroads was what uh, I latched onto and was an important part of, of my study. I think it's been lost. And one of the reasons it's been lost in Civil War history, the relationship between railroads and their development and expansion and slavery and its development and expansion, is that for so long, the history of the Civil War has been written in one track and the history of railroads have been written in another, has been written in another. And uh, I think it's great that the Colligan Project is bringing you know, technology and the war together in a, in a whole series of discussions, the, indu the industrial outcomes, because these things cannot be separated. Just as today, we can't imagine really writing a history of the 1990s and the 2000s without talking about the internet. I don't think we can. Even if we were talking about politics, we'd be hard pressed to separate those out so conveniently. Now, Bolton and Dawes take different paths into the war and through it, but their stories reveal some important ways to reconsider the Civil War. And I just want to make one key point before I, I kind of pull some uh, other visuals up and tell you about what we've, done, what we've done in the digital project and some of the arguments in the book. And the key point is this. I think it's remarkable that Bolton is enslaved in Virginia is sent to work on the railroad, on the Virginia Central Railroad. So we have a man who's enslaved in Virginia, and we have a man, Ephraim Dawes, who's the nephew of a congressman. And they're sort of one degree of separation removed, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean Rufus Dawes is Ephraim's brother. He's also a nephew of a congressman. And they are brought together in that moment in April of 1862. The war and the railroads shrink time and change space. Um, we talk about the, the world getting flatter and the globe getting more globalization and the world getting flatter today. And 19th century Americans experienced something similar. And the Civil War and the railroads together brought this com great compression of time and space. People traveled to into the war, thousands and thousands of men moving across the, uh, across the continent. This great compression of space and time. So uh, just a few comments about the main, uh, the main uh, thesis in the book, and then I'd love to open it up for questions and talk about the Civil War and railroads. I see the Civil War as a modern conflict, not a conflict between uh, an agrarian South that was on a track toward oblivion. Uh, no, I think you've gotten the picture so far. Uh, it's not a conflict between the agrarian South tracking toward some uh, end point of either self-destruction or, or it just need to be put out of its misery, <laughs> and a North that's progressive and modernizing and changing. No, I think the problem in the 1850s was that both societies saw themselves as modernizing, aggressively so. And the South was wrapping slavery into a new form. The white South was wrapping slavery into this new form that was aggressively expansionist. And so slavery was modernizing, expanding, and it's at the center of what I think was a geopolitical conflict about the future of the nation, about the future of the West, and with the territories 
That made this, this geopolitical conflict come alive. It was also a conflict between, I think, two nation states. The Confederacy for a long time has been viewed as, uh, uh, as not a legitimate nation. Um, historians are beginning to revise that view and think that the Confederacy uh, was attempting and saw itself, the White South saw itself as taking its place among the nations of the world. And so the reason, one of the reasons that the war was so bloody and so violent and so long was that these were two aggressive, modernizing nation states having at it. Neither would back down. That's not possible when two nation states go to war. In the end, um, I think the war became largely one wrapped around and dominated by the railroad network. And uh, the, the main sort of uh, chapter in the book that describes this is called The Railroad Strategy, and in which I talk about uh, um, Sherman, largely, Sheridan also, as uh, practicing a form of railroad generalship, you know, understanding that the war now has to be focused on this infrastructure of the South, dominating it, controlling it, running it for themselves. Uh, this is a, a fellow historian's map uh, that's reproduced in the book uh, about the war zones in the South, in the Confederacy. War zones are any places where there was a battle or a federal army unit. And I, can, I think you can see right away how much the war unfolded around the railroad network of the South. In fact, the, the geography of the railroads, I think, became the geography of the war. As for Sherman, <laughs> here's all of his official correspondence in digital form brought into a word cloud before, this is all of his correspondence before the, in the Atlanta campaign uh, of 1864, May through uh, August, uh, May through September. And uh, wherever uh, the railroad was the, uh, the, the paired with a verb, railroads as an object, these are the verbs that Sherman uh, used in order of their prominence. Sherman had understood by 1864, after a great deal of trial and error, not just uh, uh, the, uh, his own demons that we heard about earlier, but a trial and error in 1863 around Vicksburg with Grant, trial and error in early 1864. But Sherman makes this uh, raid on uh, uh, Meridian, Mississippi in early 1864. And his account of that is important, I think, because it, because it tells us he begins to see what he can do to the railroad system and what it might do to the South if he controls it in the way that he is planning. Um, he utterly dismantles the railroad facilities in Meridian, Mississippi. Um, not just wrapping uh, ties around trees, which are the Sherman's neckties, and you know we're all familiar with that from the Atlanta campaign. This is before that. Instead, it's everything. All the ties, all the grading, all the depot, brick by brick. Dismantle the whole thing. He did this for about 100 miles of a railroad around Meridian, and then he wrote to Grant um, something like, I'm not going to quote it directly, uh, we've made the most terrible the most terrible havoc you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> you know, he's completely dismantled, so this place. So what Sherman begins to see is that if he can render a place dead, render it worthless, cut the lifeline of the, the rail network and dis dismember it, uh, he will have established control in ways that he couldn't otherwise. Um, in, in, uh, for part of the book, uh, just last on this, we looked at 1862 and compared the Peninsula Campaign of McClellan. Some of you may be interested in the Peninsula Campaign. Uh, and we did word clouds for all of his correspondence in 1862 and compared them to uh, Sherman's in 1864, and the difference is quite striking. Last, here is the kind of dismantling that Sherman's well known for, right? Here's Atlanta. In 1864, the Roundhouse. But I think we see African Americans standing on the boxcars, the complete destruction of uh, what had been 
a modern facility. Um, this is another strong theme, I guess, in the book that uh, we've discounted the R South Railroad Network in the 1850s. A lot of historians played it down, said, well, it's, it's, it's really not that uh, modern. It's really not that significant. It's not that important. But these were glorious monuments to modernity, to civilization. This is what an advanced civilization seeking to claim its place in the family of nations would it be expected to have. And the Confederacy did, in fact, have uh, the third largest railroad network in the world behind the Union and Great Britain. So there was, there was a deeper meaning uh, to, this, to this destruction. Um, both the North and the South in the 1850s pour their energies into this railroad uh, uh, construction and expansion. And each of them stake their future on the opportunities and the possibilities of steam power. Each of them create what we might call a second nature system. Over and atop the rivers and the mountains, they create tunnels, they create rail. This is a second nature system of railroad and telegraph wire, which runs a modern society. They obliterated some natural barriers like the Allegheny Mountains and tunneled through them. They radically changed the geography of their own sections. And so when the war came, Americans both in the North and in the South were full of confidence. Now historians have looked at, at the North and the South every which way but sideways. And I've participated in that too in other projects, measuring everything we can measure. And uh, I think it's fair to say that historians have found more similarities than differences between the North and the South. So it's, it's a puzzle in a way. More similarities than differences, yet they shoot each other uh, for four years and kill 600,000 people. Their greatest similarity, I think, was their belief in themselves as modern, as advanced civilizations. And in fact, they conduct the war with great violence based on these um, unshakable beliefs in themselves. So 19th century Americans, as I said, experienced this, this compression of space and time, sort of like what we're experiencing today. Technologies making their world smaller and faster, the consequences of which they weren't sure. Um, but the relationship between slavery and the railroads was significant and deep in their society. And I think uh, I'll just end with uh, one of the big themes of the book is this uh, theme of mo mobility. Uh, and for African Americans, this is especially important, uh, from Frederick Douglass, who uh, many people think escaped on the Underground Railroad, but in, in fact, of course, as I already mentioned, he, he escaped on the railroad. He disguised himself, he secreted himself, got on the railroad, and, and uh, rode it to freedom, rode it to Philadelphia. Um, uh, in slave testimonies after the war, uh, long after the war, in the New Deal era, the railroad comes up again and again among African Americans as a figure of freedom, as, a, as, a, as the, 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 the device that brought Abraham Lincoln. There are stories of Abraham Lincoln traveling down the railroad tracks you know, to, to, to bring freedom. The railroad and freedom were, were sort of linked together in African American lore and legend, despite the fact that, of course, so many worked on uh, the railroads as slaves. And one uh, former slave in the uh, New Deal era when he uh, talked about this described the, the Civil War in this way. He said, you know, whenever um, the South was losing, I'm sorry, whenever the, whenever the Confederacy was, uh, had won a major battle, the, the train would pull into town and it would be one long whistle. And that would signal a Confederate victory. And he said, he said, and, and whenever there was a Confederate defeat, the train would pull into town, there'd be one short boop whistle, you know, and, the, and then all, all the people knew, including those enslaved, knew, of course, they knew what was happening. And he said, everybody sure did listen to that train. So thank you all very much. I'm, I'm going to be happy to take questions at this point and talk more about, uh, about uh, the project and about the book. Thanks. Oh, good.
course, the lead up to the Civil War, the big question, political question was slavery. But also there was the railroad issue. Yes. Particularly a transcontinental railroad issue. Yeah. Would you talk to that a little bit? I would. I'm so glad you asked that. That's a great question. Uh, and the, the transcontinental, uh, I think, was uh, absolutely critical in the sectional conf in, in keeping um, some aspects of the sectional political crisis uh, uh, burning. Um, conf the, the Southerners, white Southerners, saw the Southern route as superior. They, they just simply, you know, and Jefferson Davis, of course, had been one of the surveyors uh, or had commissioned the survey as Secretary of War. And um, there had been long, uh, a long history of Southern political attempts to gain the transcontinental, John C. Calhoun, among others. And, um, you know, historians have tended to, to again, kind of not treat it that significantly. But I think it absolutely was an important aggravating issue because um, a big part of both Northern and Southern so society as it, regar as, as it regarded railroads was the idea that they, one thing that they were doing was conquering nature. 19th century Americans were, they, they saw themselves as, as, as controlling, mastering the natural environment. So the tunnels, uh, being able to bore through uh, the Allegheny Mountains, being able to cross vast swamps with bridges, uh, building all sorts of new structures in order to bridge very difficult waterways and, and areas. So the railroads brought with them this idea of conquering nature, you know? And, um, uh, and in terms of the, 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 the railroad discussion about the transcontinental, pol politicians were constantly talking about, you know, uh, whether uh, nature could be bent to human will and where it could be bent to human will. What, net, what region did nature favor in the railroad economy of the future? And white Southerners talked about it as obvious that it favored uh, their region. And what they then made, drew as a conclusion, of course, was that the denial of the transcontinental to their region was a violation of modernity, a violation of the future, a violation of, of their natural position as the obvious route and the best route. Um, and so it, it, it aggravates this sectional tension in a very direct way. And uh, of course, it, 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 it appears to suggest and I would say one other thing about this. You know, well, the biggest land grant, of course, before the transcontinental was the Illinois Central. And I believe that white Southern leaders looked at what happened in Illinois, not to mention Ohio, but let's just talk about Illinois for a second with the development of the prairie. They saw that development in the 1850s and the speed with which it took place. And they knew full well that if a transcontinental railroad were brought into the Northern communities, that it would develop those places in the same way. Um, you know, an extraordinary uh, uh, challenge, uh, population challenge, um, power challenge, uh, and eventually representatives in Congress. So it was all tied together, but I think that that is an absolutely vital, vital part of the sectional crisis. Yeah. Um in my readings in the Civil War, it seemed like most of the railroad fighting was in the West. Uh, is that true? Uh, well, I think it depends on what you mean. Uh, there, there, the, it, it happens right away, East and West. I mean, in, in when the Union Army goes into Norfolk, um, the rail lines around Norfolk, for example, and Suffolk are vital. They're, they're burned by the Confederates. This is another issue. They're, who's doing the the destroying or the control, you know, the Confederates do a lot of their own destruction of their rail network, but the, in order to defend their, them, their cities uh, or their armies. But, uh, but I think in the, in, the, uh, in the East, what protected it, especially the South Carolina, North Carolina, you know, were really the mountain regions, right? And, uh, and the, coastal, uh, the coastal tidewater where the Union Navy could gain a foothold, but not move inland very easily. And so, yes, there's a big area which Sherman eventually does, of course, dismantle. But go ahead. Yeah. So how, how much track did the Confederates have at the start of the war, and how much was eventually destroyed? Yeah, um, good question. At the start of the Civil War, there's about 
9,800 miles of, uh, of, of Confederate railroad track. Um, how much of it is destroyed? This is a really uh, interesting question. It's hard to get a handle, first of all, on who's destroying it, <laughs> for what purpose, um, and, then, uh, and then one thing I try to do in the end of the book is document the rebuilding of the Southern Railroad Network. This is a little known story, and um, it turns out that the United States Army under Sherman um, in 1865 uh, and the United States Military Railroad uh, Construction Corps um, rebuild over 2,000 miles of railroad in the South and give it back to the Southern companies, uh, brand new. Um, the, I mean, this also happens in Virginia. Um, millions and millions of dollars in labor, uh, in, so in labor costs, in, in capital costs, in equipment, are poured into the Southern railroads in the summer of 1865 before they're handed back to the Southern companies. And um, uh, now, not all of them. That is, the rail lines that stayed in the Confederacy the longest didn't get that treatment, right? It was the, all of the lines that, uh, but that uh, it ends up being about uh, half of the railroad companies in the South. So this, in, I think what's lost often is that the generous terms of, re of early reconstruction. Much of this infrastructure was rebuilt and turned over to the Southern companies in se on September uh, 15th, I believe, 1865. Some others were January, but you know, a lot of it was rebuilt. And they kept extensive records of this. And I mean extensive. Every nail, every, you know, <laughs> these lists, the, the Army would keep these lists of everything that went into the rebuilding of these uh, railroads. In that rebuilding, was the former slave labor used again for the rebuilding in a large proportion? Yes, absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Uh, they were thousands of African Americans working for the United States Military Railroads, uh, and, then they're w and then they're working um, to rebuild those lines. Um, uh, now later, of course, by 1880, um, most railroad workers in the South by 1880 are black. Um, they can, many of them continue to work for the railroad companies into uh, and this is a little studied subject. I wasn't able to do much with it, but um, uh, I, we, we've done some intensive sort of uh, forensic work on the 1880 US population census and discovered that um, the racial identity of um, railroad workers in the South in Virginia, 52% of railroad workers in Virginia in 1880 are black. So they, per they are in, it's, no, it's not just that they come back into the industry later with Pullman cars or something, no. They're there from, I think, yes, from 1865, they stay. Many of them continue to work for the railroad companies. Others, you know, like Balton, we talked about, they, they leave the South entirely, but many stay and continue to work on these, on these railroads. It's a good question, really good question. Question from a different angle, what was the impact of the Union blockade on the Southern Railroad? <laughs> That's a great question also. The impact of the Union blockade. Uh, I think the Union blockade was absolutely instrumental in suffocating the South. Um, and it has a tremendous impact on the, on the railroads in terms of, uh, well, a, a couple, you know, first, Let's just back up, and one, one issue is that uh, s s southern states had built their rail network with, um, largely with state bonds, okay? They, they had issued state bonds. The states owned parts of the Southern Railroad Network, um, and those state bonds were floated in European markets. And uh, so uh, London banks and uh, Frankfurt banks and Paris banking houses, but mainly in London, uh, Rothschild, Peabody, uh, and others, bought Virginia bonds, Missouri bonds. These were financing rail the railroad growth of the 1850s. The blockade cuts off the South from communication. 
with Europe almost in, you know entirely, and uh, uh, and this is a this is a huge issue. It, it doesn't just affect cotton; it affects finance, business. Uh, the the you asked directly about the railroads themselves. Um, very quickly after that blockade, uh, the rail lines of the South are really transporting only government goods and then whatever business they can get internally. Um, there's no, you know, there's no import export through on on these in these uh, uh, ports. Yeah, to speak of, but it's a really good question because it speaks to the international dimensions of the of the Civil War. Yeah. Were the, were the uh, railroad gauges essentially the same in the north and the south? Or I've heard they were different sometimes. Yeah, they were different. Um, this is another uh, subject of some uh, small controversy, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> Uh, the, the railroad gauges were different in both sections. Uh, that is, there were lots of different sub-regions. In other words, there really wasn't yet, it, this comes out of the Civil War, a standard gauge. Um, if there is a standard gauge, we could say retrospectively it's four f feet, eight and a half inches. But it's really the Civil War and the U.S. military railroads running 2,000 miles of rail, rebuilding it, and you know coming in and changing the southern gauges from five feet to four, eight and a half, that begin to assemble uh, what we would call a kind of a standard gauge. But before the Civil War, when the war opens, you know, I get my my view of this is that the South was no more disconnected and disjointed as a network than the North. You know, there were. One economist has looked at this and found there were, uh, uh, there were nine different subregions of gauge difference. And you could look at the South with a five foot gauge and say, actually, that's the British gauge, that's the modern gauge, and they had more of their gauge in one, uh, one gauge than, than most of the North did. But, uh, you know, it, it, it really, I think the point is, a lot of people think that the South was crippled by a by a disjointed gauge system, but so the North was too. They overcame it faster, and they overcame it in the war in ways uh, that uh, that the Confederacy did not. Yeah, that's a great question. You mentioned the Illinois Central yes. in the 1850s. Yeah. Can you discuss a future president and his role in that? I in the Illinois Central. Yes. Um. Well, Lincoln was uh, a, a lawyer, um, obviously. He practiced uh, a wide variety uh, of, of law. He, he took what came in the door. Um, he did work for the Illinois Central um, and, and took different cases. But I, you know, I didn't look into the Lincoln's legal career particularly. Um, uh, my colleague, Kenneth Winkle, has written about Lincoln's early early life and is writing a new book on Lincoln and Washington. Um, other scholars who are doing, who, who are work, work on Lincoln really focus more on his, um, uh, some of the early race cases, you know, cases that involved African Americans, the Matson case. Um, I, I, I guess I would say he was a, he was a corporate attorney who would take clients, including the Illinois Central. <laughs> so. I don't know if that answers your question or if what you were looking for, but. Uh. <coughs> you say that most of the uh, people who worked on the railroads in the, were 50% black in the South. When they did the transcontinental highway, uh, road, uh, didn't it change from that to the uh, Europeans and the Irish and the, uh, the uh, Europeans and sure. also the uh, Chinese sure. and a variety of ones there. They didn't have very many blacks in that, that area there. Right, right. This is, a, this is also a really good question. Um, and really, one question we might ask is why? <laughs> um, why weren't there African American workers on the transcontinental um, out, of, out of Omaha, um, Council Bluffs, in of you know 1865 or 66 or something, uh, it was mostly Irish labor, 
um, almost entirely Irish labor. Um, like many of the crews, construction crews, that had built railroads across Iowa and across Illinois as well. Um, Chinese labor being used in, on the Central Pacific, but not uh, at that point on the Union Pacific, right? But the question, really, your question, wh why not African American labor? And it turns out that um, I've, I've seen some evidence that there was African American labor on the, uh, on the Union Pacific in 1864 and 1865. There's a government report that there were 300 freedmen and 1,200 Irish laborers in 1864 working on the, the very first part of the Union Pacific. Um, some, uh, the Secretary of the Interior, Lincoln's Secretary of the Interior, had a, put out a report that uh, in 1864 that suggested that, well, the solution to the labor issue for the transcontinental is just to use freedmen. I mean, they're on the U.S. military railroads. They're experienced. Um, they're, uh, uh, let's move them to Omaha. Uh, I, I've not found, w and I've looked at the, the literature on the Union Pacific, I, I can't find where that idea went, you know? I don't know. Um, there were, I ha there's a report that there were 300 here, but beyond that, uh, 300 meaning in Nebraska. But beyond that, I don't, I don't know. Mm-hmm. One more. Just that last comment you made, and very briefly, and it would sound a little um, wrong-hearted if I didn't stress that on my mother's side, there's a good Irish, Irish Catholic stock. Yeah. So, but remember at the the draft riots in New York, yes, the fact that you know that the immediate you know, Irish and Scots-Irish history is being, you know, the Scots are kicked out of Scotland into Northern Ireland, and they and the Irish get to struggle with each other, and, and the English is rid of them both. They come to the United States during the Civil War. There's, they react to being drafted on arriving on the shores to right. going after the black communities for no obvious reason, I, I guess, except that they were vulnerable. Chicago, same sort of things. So there's a habit of being picked on. And if they are the first labor group heading west with the railroad, they are going to hold on to that position, I suspect, out of habit and defensiveness, just as you would find, you know, even up into this century uh, in big cities, fire departments, police departments, really holding that ethnic line mm -hmm. that they got in with early and said, this is ours, right? Yeah. All understandable. Yeah. Yeah, just to, just to conclude, I, I guess I would go back to, um, you know, the original vision for the transcontinental through the north was uh, Asa Whitney's uh, plan. He put the plan before Congress in 1849. It was called a plan for uh, a project for a Pacific Railroad. Um, and Asa Whitney talked about, he was a promoter of the transcontinental idea in the late 1840s, and he really stayed after it in the 1850s. But one of the keys to his plan, his idea for the transcontinental and why the government should fund it, was this idea of bringing immigrants, Irish immigrants, uh, into eastern cities and then moving them out onto the prairies and the plains, that this would, this would, this would diffuse labor uh, from the urban settings, reduce tensions in the cities, uh, bring into Republican free land holding uh, a class of people who are coming to our shores. You know, there's this vision of a free labor um, expansion and that the, that the transcontinental would make possible. Uh, and for immigrants. Uh, yeah. Right, right. So, uh, so that, that plan for a project for the Pacific Railroad is one that I think, um, um, you know, speaks to the idea of the North as uh, bringing immigrant labor in, settling on these open lands, aggressively expanding into the West, and, and, and this is why in the 1850s it becomes such, a, such a, an important issue. Um, do we, one more, or you're ready? You're, okay. Oh, I don't. Actually, <coughs> I can go. 
I have one. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I guess we'll have one more. Okay. <laughs> I would like to invite you to tell the audience a, a little bit about how they might find the digital history okay. project that allows them to go and do this research, it allows you sure. to go do this research on them. Yeah, that's a that's a great uh, uh, that's a great question. Um, the URL uh, for the project, the, the the website address is is actually in the book and and uh, it's available right out here. I understand, um, but it's just railroads.unl, University of Nebraska Lincoln, railroads.unl.edu. Um, it is Railroads and the Making of Modern America. You can Google that and find it very easily. All of our digit, all of the sources for the book are online. Um, all of the maps, all of the images in the book are online, except for a couple that we couldn't clear the copyright permissions for, but, but uh, most of them. Um, and a great deal more. Um, the, the Railroads Project has material about William Jennings Bryan and his campaign. It has material about the settlement of Nebraska, the Burlington Railroad. We've also developed an employee database of all historic uh, payroll records we've been able to find. Um, so many people's grandparents, great-grandparents worked on the railroad in the 19th century. And yet there's no way, unlike the United States military and the National Archives, to go find the record of your, of your ancestor who worked on the railroad. So we've been working on uh, payroll records. We've been working on land sale documents, uh, newspaper materials, and uh, maps. We have a whole slew of maps and images of the railroad in the 19th century. And we're always looking for suggestions. So this digital project is used by schools all over the country. It's a wonderful resource. It's free. Uh, it's, it's meant to make history available uh, to you. And to, uh, and to educators in schools. So uh, it's railroads.unl.edu, and um, it's there for you, and I hope you enjoy it.